Considering the amount of true 911 calls I listen to every day, it's hard for me to be left speechless. But these calls did exactly that. In March 2021, an 11-year-old child called 911 for help as she and her 6-year-old brother were trapped inside a burning Charlotte apartment. The children were at home alone at the time of the incident. The house is on fire, help! Please, I have a little brother, please! And what, huh? what, what's the number of the building? <laughs> I don't know, folks. Just help. You've got fire companies coming out to Rose Thorn Place. That's the apartment complex, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so please like, just help. Is everybody out of the apartment? No, we're inside of it. Okay, and the apartment is on fire? <laughs> yeah, help. Just help. Okay, we've got fire companies coming out there. Do you know what your phone number is? Um, no. We can't see anything. Everything is burning. Are you inside? <laughs> yeah, we're inside. You're inside? Where Where are you in the apartment? Huh? Where are you in the apartment? We're right in the, my bedroom. Okay, where by is the your bathroom. bedroom? <laughs> where Where is that? Is it upstairs, downstairs? Huh? It's in the back. In the back. Is it down the window. <laughs> I'm at the window. Is it down You can see me at the window. You can see me at the window. Oh, it's the safe under there. No, it's the come over here, bunny. Can you, can you close the door? Huh? Can you close you the door? You can shut down. It's burning. Okay. All right. We've got fire companies coming out there. Can you get to the window? Burning. Okay. Everything is how many, how many, burning. How many people are with you? <laughs> Only two people. Everybody else is gone. It's just ah. you. It's yeah, just me and my brother. Hurry. How old are you? I'm 11 and my brother is 6. Okay. We've got fire company. Ah. Stay on the phone with me. Hurry, hurry, hurry. It's burning. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Are you, okay. Are you injured at all? No, not yet. Okay. Is the fire... Is the fire in the room with you, or is it outside the room? No, it's in a different room, but it's, it's getting closer. Okay, where are your parents? My mom's at work. No one's here with us. Okay, so we know we sleep not knowing. So is it just you two in the room? Yeah. Okay, all right. We've got fire companies no. coming out there. I need you to stay on the phone with me. Okay, please hurry up. How old are you? Oh, I'm only 11. You're 7 and 11? Yeah. I hear them coming. Okay, yep, the fire truck's coming. Are you upstairs or downstairs? I'm upstairs. Okay, you're you're upstairs in the back of the apartment. They should see me at the window. Okay. Can I be yelling for help? Yep, we've got fire companies coming out there. I need you to stay on the phone with me. Keep talking to me, okay? Okay, but hurry, please. Yep, they're coming. Oh. <sighs> Is the fire, has the fire got through the door yet, or are you still safe? Um, it hasn't gotten through the door, but there's a lot of smoke to pull over. We can't breathe. I okay. just saw them pass by us. All right, yep, they're going. They're they're pulling up. <laughs> there's smoke in your room? Yeah. Okay. A lot. All right. Yeah! Help! Are you, are you at the window now? Yeah. Okay. Right here, right here, right here. There's a lot of stuff burning down. No, not right there, buddy. Over here, over here. Ah, yeah. Can you breathe? Help! Help! Help us! Hey, can you put something over your face? Put like a picture or something over your face. Are you talking to the fireman? On the floor? On the floor? Right here? A baby? Right We can't. Are you talking to the fireman? I can't. Can you come through the door? Get down. Are the firemen?
been talking to you? I need you to stay right down on the floor by the window. Stay by that window, okay? If you can find a blanket, cover your face with the blanket. Are the firemen with you? In less than four minutes, firefighters were on the scene. Authorities said the fire, caused by an unattended item left cooking, broke out just after 6.30 p.m. at the Presley South End Apartments near Barringer Drive, just south of Uptown Charlotte. Medics on the scene evaluated six other individuals, but nobody was taken to the hospital, though some individuals did have minor injuries. Charlotte Fire said the kids had been reunited with their parents or guardians and that the American Red Cross had stepped in to help. Engine 43 earned recognition for their fast action in helping to pull two kids from their burning second-story apartment. Also earning recognition was Fire Communications Dispatcher T.C. Schuler remained calm despite finding himself on the line with a frantic 11-year-old caller. Firefighters credit the little girl for knowing her address, which they say helped responders find her. They say the story is a good reminder for all parents to talk to their kids about emergency plans and how important it is for kids to memorize their addresses. On November 28, 2010, Penelope Pratt called the Australian Emergency Line, begging the dispatcher to send the police to her hideout. While making the call, she hid in the bushes, away from the intruders. It was not the first time she had called for help that evening. Sadly, the emergency operator never transferred the call to the police. Hello, what do you need police? Yep. Just bear with me a moment, please. There's two people that you want okay, to Okay, just bear with me a moment. I'm trying to find the location. Could that be... Yeah, that's supposed to... What's the problem? That's supposed to give me money, I was there. And I was okay, hang on, hang on, slow down. What do you need police for? They just got people from here in the hospital. Who's they? they? Around. Who are we talking about? I'm, I'm within the vicinity of being heard. Do you understand what that means? Okay, well, if I can't hear you, if I can't hear you, how am I meant to help you? Trust me, you want to get to this address. Okay, and you need to tell me what we're going to the address for. They wanted people. Um, Who are the people? James Potter or Mendez or whatever his name is. Sorry, what's his name, James what? Potter or Mendez. I don't know if he's going to get me back. He may not. Okay, well, you need to tell me what you want me to send police there for, please. He's wanted. And for what? He's dangerous. There's warrants out for his arrest. Are you for real? For what? Are you I'm for not real? a police I member. Don't know. Stop yelling I don't at me. Know. Then how do you know that there's warrants? Oh my god. Okay, well I'm just trying to do my job. Please, please. Okay, if you want to speak to them, you'll have to call them directly. Do you want me to send police or not? Yes. Okay, then you need to answer my question. I'm hiding in a bush answering your question. Why are you hiding in a bush? Oh my god. Oh my god. Why are you hiding in a bush? Oh my god. Oh my god, what? I'm free file and offended. What are you hiding in a bush for? Because I'm ringing the police. I'm free file and offended. How do you know these three violent people? <sighs> Through a friend of mine that's not really a friend. Okay, triple O lady. What is your name, please? please? Penny Pratt. What is your name, please? I'm Paul Taker, number two. What is your contact telephone Sorry, number, please? Paul what? Paul Taker, number two. So why are these three people violent? What have they oh done? Oh, my God. Can you stop saying, oh, my God, Penny? Business. Okay, well, it is my business if you want me to send police, but you can either ask questions or you don't. Penny, then... 27-year-old Pratt had been hiding from two men in a small Baronia suburb in Australia for quite a while before her luck ran out. According to further investigation, the men were after her due to an alleged drug debt to the tune of about $160. They were later identified as John Potter and Aaron Gibson. The victim had a troubled childhood. She battled with learning disabilities, and once she started high school, she began experimenting with hardcore drugs like heroin. As an adult, Pratt had two young children who she did not have custody of when she was murdered. 
After her father died in 2009, she was left over 100,000 Australian dollars, but instead of using it to catapult a new life, Pratt spent the money irresponsibly, and it was eventually wasted away. A year later, her partner overdosed on drugs and died, which led her to spending time with James Potter and Aaron Gibson, drug addicts who often took amphetamines. In November of that same year, she called triple zero and was placed in the psychiatric ward and could leave whenever she was ready. Potter and Gibson went looking for Pratt, and when they couldn't find her at home, they were told she was at the hospital. It was almost 11 p.m. and the men went to see her, but the receptionist would not let them in. This made Potter furious. He began swearing and was forceful with a security guard called to calm him down. He then lied to the guard and said Pratt was his sister and had clothes for her. Security then called Pratt and put her on the phone with Potter. She made the fatal mistake of leaving the hospital with the men when Potter told her he had some money to give her. The trio drove to Potter's girlfriend's house in Baronia, but the 27-year-old quickly left. Shortly after, Triple Zero received a call from Pratt in which she told the operator she had been picked up from the hospital by people drunk driving and said she wanted to go back as she would cop a beating. The dispatcher tried to find her location, but the caller repeatedly said she just wanted her money before eventually hanging up on the operator. Ten minutes later, Pratt called again, the final call they would receive from her. In a bid to save herself from imminent danger, Pratt had been trying to describe her location to the emergency operator. However, she couldn't as the dispatcher ended the call while she was still talking, which ultimately led to her brutal death. It's alleged that she began fighting with Gibson outside not long after and Krellekamp instructed them to take it indoors. The feud continued with Pratt demanding her money. At some point, Gibson violently grabbed the victim's hair, pointed a 22 caliber sawn-off rifle at her face, and shot her in the jaw. She began pleading for her life, and Gibson put her in a chair and shot her in the left side of her head. Potter helped Gibson drag her to a bath, and he took the gun and shot her in the right eye. The coroner's report said Gibson told Potter to finish the job. He got a large kitchen knife, stabbed her in the heart several times, and cut her throat. The gruesome murder continued until she was wrapped in a living room rug and placed in a car boot that belonged to Krellicamp, the man who saw Pratt trying to flee the house earlier that night. Pratt's body was found three weeks after the murder in the Dandenong Ranges National Park, Olinda. The police were only able to get to the bottom of the case after an alleged accomplice, 48-year-old Adrian Krellicamp, wrote and handed over a 15-page statement to the authorities, implicating the other accomplices. Krellicamp stated that although he didn't have a hand in the murder, he had helped the killers, 24-year-old Potter and 31-year-old Gibson, hide Pratt's body in his car. Together, the three drove to a bushland where they dumped the body. Krellekamp was later charged with being an accomplice to murder and possessing amphetamines and cannabis. He was, however, released on bail after the role he played in bringing the killers to book was duly considered. Adrian Krellekamp ran from cameras as he was released on bail. Earlier, police telling the Melbourne Magistrates Court he'd helped dispose of Penelope Pratt's body in the Dandenong Ranges. It's alleged he witnessed the shooting on November 28th, then tried to remove any evidence of the killing from... Potter and Gibson, on the other hand, were charged with the murder. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, Potter and Gibson were sentenced to 24 and 22 years in prison, respectively. Today, 31-year-old Aaron Anthony Gibson faced court charged with murder and was remanded in custody. A third man, 24-year-old James Potter, was arrested today and also charged with murder. It seemed like justice was served since Pratt's murderers were eventually caught and sent to prison. However, outside the courthouse, the victim's aunt, Susan Clear, said she wished the killers had been given the death penalty instead since they had also taken her niece's life. The next callers were also failed by the dispatcher, despite the frantic 911 call. Brianne Lasley said she was sending a text message at night when she heard a man say, Hey girl, I'm coming in, through her partially open window. What key do you want? What do you want? Hello? What do you want? Hello? Hey, 
is free with Acro English and Orca Gives. I'm sorry I missed your call. It's on September 23, 2015, Brianne Orbri and her sister Kaylee Lasley were attacked, stabbed, and nearly beaten in their Salt Lake City home by a man who'd entered their house around midnight. After telling Bree he was going to climb through the window, he said, cooperate with me. But the brave woman told the intruder he wasn't going to get what he wanted out of the situation. She fought the man, whom Salt Lake City authorities identified as 48-year-old Robert Berger, as her sister slept downstairs. Although Bree had hoped to keep the man from finding Kaylee, her sister heard the screams and ran upstairs to help. They struggled against Berger for 15 minutes but managed to call 911 and yell out their address to the dispatcher. Several neighbors also called the emergency service. During the struggle with the sisters, Berger allegedly pulled out a knife and stabbed Bree in the abdomen and legs. The pair made four 911 calls during the terrifying ordeal, each time desperately pleading and screaming, help us, please, help us, he's going to kill us, help us, please. Not one of those phone calls were dispatched. Kaylee was eventually able to escape the house during the attack. A police officer who was attending to another place on the street where Berger had allegedly tried to break in earlier heard the sister's screams and ran to help. The intruder held Bree in front of him and stabbed her. The victim said she realized that there was no way the officer could shoot the man without hitting her. So when Berger raised his arm to stab her hard, Officer Ben Hone fired a shot from 12 feet away into the dark. He hit Berger in the face, immediately killing him. Brianne had to peel his dead body off of her. In contrast to the Lasley statement, Salt Lake City 911 Communications Bureau Director Lisa Burnett said that police had arrived within minutes and took control of the scene. And Priority Dispatch said their review showed the system was never used, despite the numerous calls because they couldn't determine the address. As a result of the negligence, Brianna filed a $300,000 civil lawsuit against the dispatch company for gross negligence. The suit claimed that she and her sister's frantic and urgent calls for help, as an intruder was beating them during a home invasion, failed to send police to their home, which has caused endless distress for the sisters. The outcome of the civil lawsuit has not been made public. In September 2010, Derry Velarde had just arrived home from work when she was confronted by another female who threw the liquid at her. 911 emergency. Excuse me, somebody just threw acid on my mom. Yeah, I don't even, she just pulled out of the car. She just got home from work and somebody threw acid on her. Okay, what is the address? Sean, I don't even know my address. We live on of this certain what is, Give me the address. You got to ask somebody for the address, please. <laughs> I'll get them. What is it, Mom? Give me the Mom, I don't. 1327 East Salt Vista Drive. South Salt Vista Drive. South Salt Vista Drive. Apartment 1091. Apartment 1091. Okay, I'm going to get the paramedics started. Just a moment. Hang on. Just stay on the phone with me. Okay? okay. So that's. comes up in the middle of the street, okay? But what is the, uh, what's the name of the apartment complex? Vista Grove. Okay, just a moment. Let me get them started. Hold on just a second. What do I do? She has wait acid the on her body. Just wait for the paramedics. Hang on one second. I do have the address now. She's in the shower right now. No, don't tell her not to go in the shower until we get the information. She said not to go in the shower until you get the paramedics. Okay. She's already in the shower. Tell them not to have her in the shower. Okay. Not to have you in the shower. Mom, who threw acid on you? Some woman. Okay, so she, your mother is conscious, alert, and breathing right now, correct? Yes, she's Does she screaming. know who the person is that threw Mom, the acid? Mom, you know who the person is that threw acid on you? She, my mom does not know who she is. Okay, hang on one second. She, was she in the apartment complex, Mom? Yes, Some lady in the apartment complex. Okay, is she? Is your mother still in the shower? No, she just got out of the shower. Okay, all right, hang on. I tell her I do have police and paramedics on the way. Okay. Does she need to dry off? I, I have to. I am not medically trained on getting them to you, okay? But I need okay. you to give me some more information. Hang on one second. 
it was. Do I need to describe you what the lady was like? Yes, I need to find out Hispanic if she's black, woman, white, Hispanic, um, Hispanic woman. Okay, Hispanic woman with her hair in a bun. About how old? Like in her 30s or 40s. 30s or 40s. Okay, 30 to 40. What color shirt was she wearing? What color shirt? Black shirt. Black, black. black shirt. Black jogging sweatpants that look like capris. Okay, hang on one second. Did she get it in the car? She got it in her car, too. She threw it while your mother was in the car? Yeah, she just. Pulled up from work. My mom was screaming outside the apartment. Okay, hang on. Her car door was open and everything. Let me just put this all in here. Does she know what direction the woman went? What direction did she go? She went south. She went north. What area is she burned on there? Ask me questions. She burned all over her body. Like okay. Her face. Like it's on her face. I can already see her skin, like lighter and darker. Now, is the, the suspect, what direction did she, did she go, on foot or in a vehicle? Did she go on foot or a vehicle? On foot. Hang on one second. All right, you're trying to, she's trying to shower it off just cool water, not hot, not cold, just cool, okay? And I do Mom. have them on the way. Not cold, not hot, just like cool water. And what is your mother's name? They're asking her name. Terry. Terry? Terry. D-E-R-R-I. Okay, what's your name? Jasmine. Okay, hang on one second. You found her? Oh, well, I need to check it out from everywhere. Found who? Oh, what? Um, Sean, my friend, just that he has heard that she's a white lady with all black on. Do you know it? Does he know where she is? Black shirt, black sweatpants. You did put that in there. Now, does he? Okay. Did he see where she is? Now, can you can you yeah. answer, Jasmine? Did she, did he say that he saw where she is now? Um, people have seen her in the apartment complex. He's looking for her right now. Who's looking for her? My friend Sean. Okay, hang on one second. So she may still be in the apartment complex? Her? She may still be in the apartment complex? Probably. Yeah, probably. People have seen her. Okay, hang on. I'm just trying to see if I can get any other information for them. The officers are all there in the fire department. You let me know when they find you. Okay. And I do have them coming to apartment 1091. How is your mother doing? Just as Velarde was getting out of her car, a woman approached her with what she thought was a cup of water. Yeah, uh, yeah I was coming home from work, and um, I pulled into my parking spot at the apartments, you know, like I always do. And I was excited to run inside, change clothes, go meet a friend. And um, I, I was opening my car door, and I saw a woman coming up from behind, towards you know, from the back of my car. And I thought she was going to approach me and speak to me, but she didn't say anything. And she just, she looked like she had a drink in her hand. It looked like a clear glass of water. And, um, and then she just tossed it in my face and um, started to lightly like, jog away. She didn't even like full on run. She just kind of jogged away. And uh, I knew it immediately it was acid or something acidic. It was burning. So she didn't immensely. say she didn't say a word. It was just a glance, no. and then and then that was it, huh? Yeah. You yeah. you talked earlier um, with Erica Hill when you spoke with her on Thursday about this being premeditated. How much does that scare you to know that someone was tracing your steps and knew your exact schedule? It was it was very scary. Um, I haven't been back since, as a matter of fact. I, you know, I was afraid to go back to my apartment. And it's scary just knowing that um, I'm pretty aware of my surroundings. You know, especially at night and things like that, but yeah. it was the middle of the afternoon. I wasn't thinking anything of it. Like I said, I was just getting ready to run inside, change clothes, so I wasn't being overly cautious, you know, yeah. but to know that somebody might be following you or watching you, and you have no idea. The 41-year-old quickly ran inside her apartment, washed her face in the sink, ripped off her clothes, and jumped in the shower. According to the paramedics and the police, her instincts and actions saved Velarde from sustaining the severity of the burns. She was hospitalized in the burn unit of Maricopa County Medical Center in Phoenix for six days. Upon arrival, she was kept outside the hospital for 20 minutes as a biohazard team analyzed the liquid and decontaminated her. 
The 41-year-old was left with severe burns on her face, neck, arms, and back. Her tongue was also affected. The emergency crew that responded to the crime also had to be treated because their eyes were red and burning from the vapor coming from the acid. In an interview, Velarde recalled the vicious attack and said, she just stopped abruptly and looked at me and threw it in my face. Velarde claimed that she did not know the woman. However, she said there was a slight familiarity. When you were here, you said you weren't sure who attacked you. you it was a split second, but you noticed an evil look in her eye and there was something familiar about this person. Has anything clicked in that time since we last spoke about who this person may be or how they could potentially be connected to you? Um, no, really, um, it's kind of just, it's kind of all still the same, you know. I, I don't really, I don't recall her. We're still working on, you know, who she is and, and the connection, obviously, behind who did this. She described the suspect as a 30 to 40-year-old Hispanic woman with black shoulder-length hair, about 5 foot 6 inches tall. 140 pounds, and she was wearing a black tank top and black sweatpants with a white stripe. Filardi's son spoke about the difficulty of his mom's attack. Um, as you can imagine, just seeing your mom in illness or in any kind of pain is hard, but to know that somebody did it out of hate and just pure evil, it's, it's tough. Yeah. He expressed how proud he is of his mom for remaining upbeat and positive. I, I don't know how she can stay so spot positive and strong. It's it's incredible. I don't, I, I don't know how I would handle this or deal with it, definitely. Are you proud of her? Yeah, very. When asked if she had anything to say to her attacker, Velarde responded, I'm the kind of person that I'm not going to. I'm just not going to waste any more of my time thinking about her or she's just not a thought in my mind. Derry's road to recovery hasn't been easy, but she has not given up. How are you doing? How's your healing process going? Uh, it's going really well. I, I'm, I'm really surprised um, as far as how quickly the, the burns continue to get better every day. You know, um, still a little uncomfortable. You know, I'm not on any pain meds anymore, so I'm dealing with that. And, you know, but I'm doing good. Good. Yeah. In April 2014, Ronald Karras called 911 after being hit with a brick, stuffed in a trunk of a vehicle, and kidnapped. 911. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm in the back of a trunk. My license number is. YTG or TT? Yeah. Which one? YTG. Okay, what do you mean? YTG. The trunk? I mean, they threw me in the back of the trunk. Who? Um, it's, um, Deb, um, Jordan, and then another guy. I'm not sure where are you at? Is. Where were you when they put you in I the trunk? I don't know. Where were you when they put you in the trunk? Around 6th Avenue. We're at on 6th Avenue. Um, I'm not real sure. I need some kind of location so I can start officers in that area. Oh, well, it's got to be somewhere in the 6th uh, Avenue area. In the 6th Avenue area? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a black impala. A black impala? A black impala. They're out here. I can't talk right now. Sir? Who did this to you? Barb. Barb who? No, I'm sorry. Deb Jordan? Yes. Okay. We're, we're stopped right now. Can you... Is there a, a lever? Listen, listen. In most trunks, yeah, in your car, I there's a there lever. Is. There is. There is. Okay, can you pull that lever? But they're, but they're in the car. Is the car stopped? I would pull that lever and take off running. Why not? Right here. Right here. How long were you?
you in the car. where you're at. told the 911 dispatcher he didn't know where he was being taken. Police officers were able to trace his phone to Prospect Park in Des Moines. When officers arrived, they found a car with a shattered window and Karras in a nearby wooded area. The 60-year-old was found unresponsive and bleeding from his head. According to police reports, he had been beaten with a brick. Karras was immediately rushed to Mercy Medical Center. Des Moines Police Detective Danny White said the 911 call was disturbing. The whole thing is just disturbing. It doesn't matter how many times you listen to it, I've listened to it probably a hundred times and it gets me every time I listen to it. The detective was relieved they arrived on time to save Karras. I think had we not gotten there when we did, then he, he definitely would have probably perished in the, in the woods. Deborah Oliver and co-conspirator John Deering were arrested and charged with first-degree kidnapping. The pair kidnapped Karras because they believed he had money on his person. Oliver was sentenced after a jury convicted her of first-degree kidnapping, attempted murder, and willful injury in October. Following a bench trial, the district court found Deering guilty of kidnapping in the first degree, attempt to commit murder, and willful injury. Karras suffered severe brain damage. The victim's stepdaughter, Jackie Martin, testified that he needed 24-hour care. For a while, he had a hard time recognizing family members. Martin looked directly at Oliver during her sentencing, telling her that the beating left Karras unable to attend his step-grandson's football games or have conversations. Sadly, Ronald Karras died a year later from the complications of the brutal attack. On June 5, 2009, less than a month after she attempted suicide, a 33-year-old woman identified as Deborah Janelle Jeter placed a blood-chilling call to 911 to inform the authorities that she had just killed children. Hill County 911, what's your emergency? I just killed my children. Excuse me? I just killed my children. Where are you? Um, I'm in the abandoned house on Highway 77 right after you go underneath the highway. One of them's still alive. Hurry. How? Under what highway? You're on Highway 77 where? I'm on Highway 77 right after you go under 35 going towards Milford. Get an ambulance out here to save the one that didn't die. Come on. Hurry up. What's your name? Bitch, call them. Have you already called them? Yes, ma'am, I have. Okay. I need your name. I don't want to tell you my name.
Hello. Hello. Are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Seventy-seven toward Milford. Right after you cross under the bridge, she's telling me she killed her children. Are you in your car? No, I'm not in my car. I'm in the house walking around. And um, one of them's still alive for real. She's asking to be saved, and I couldn't handle that. And so now she's, she's, she's in an abandoned house. At it's that been way. a long time. She might already die because she's let out a lot. And hold on. What, baby? Okay. Well, I've got we've got people in route. Get an, get an ambulance because one of them's still alive. She said. Can you tell me what happened, ma'am? Hello. Ma'am, can you tell me what happened? I can't get the door open. You can't get what door open, darling? The front door, so y'all can come in when y'all get here. Why won't it open? I don't know. Hold on. Are you on the right hand side of the road or the left hand side of the road, sweetie? Okay, they're coming. They're coming. I just I would just want to try to clarify clarify exactly where they are. Can you tell me what happened? I don't want to say. I don't see any lights. They're not coming. Well, they're on their way. My partner's getting getting them to you just as quickly as she can. Okay. How many? How many children do you have? Two. Huh? Two. Two. Is dead. One of them is dead. She's dead, dead. But the other one, she wants to be saved, and I'm. She needs to be safe, and I don't see any lights. Tell me to get down here. Honey, they're I coming. They're coming. Do you have any weapons? Um, I do. I have a knife. She has a knife. Should I throw it away? No, ma'am. Just, just put it there. She's got a knife. Can you not tell me what your name is? Huh? Huh? Hold on. What's your name, darling? I'm not telling you my name. I'm trying to walk the door. How old are your children? Hold on. But then, hurry up. Honey, they are coming. They're on their way. You should be hearing lights and sirens. Seeing lights and hearing sirens. Are you still with me? Hello? I'm here. They're not here. They, they're on their way, sweetheart. They had to come from different parts of the county. Hold on, kid. They're coming. Tell them not to shoot me. I don't have a gun. Okay. She doesn't want to get shot because she doesn't have a gun. Okay. When they get there, uh -huh. I want you to lay the knife down. Out. When you get the door open, I want you to lay the knife down so they can see that you don't have any weapons. Okay. Oh, my God. She's dead. Oh, my God. How old are the children? I'm not telling you. She wants you to hurry. Honey, to they are coming. They're coming as fast as they can. They're trying to be sure. Do you see them? They're coming. Do you see them? Do you see them? No, I'm from her. They're coming. Hold on. Can you see the lights? No. I see something down at the end of the road. I see car lights, but not, not fire lights, not police lights. She says she can see. I hear them. Okay. 
come out with our hands up. Okay, you There's need to. Up the I know, I understand that. I want. With my hands up. Okay. Uh, she's dead. By the house, both hands up except for no, one. Because I'm on the phone. They're coming. She's, she's got her hands up except for They're the coming. fact that the one that she's on the phone with. So she's out in the yard. She said she's out in the yard beside the house. Okay, goodbye. I see them. They're right here. Goodbye. All right, bye. In May 2009, a month before the incident, the husband of Deborah Jeter, Lester Lee Jeter, filed for a separation from his wife. At the time, the two already had two girls together, and all appeared to be well between them, so not many people knew in detail Lee's reason for wanting a separation. However, the couple's neighbors had a few speculations. A lumberyard worker, 56-year-old Steve Ralston, who lived on the same street as the couple, revealed that he had often called the police on the couple. The Jeters lived in a single-story building, and according to the then 56-year-old, it was a noisy house and other neighbors also had called the police. According to court reports, the separation hit the mother of two quite hard. So much so that she tried to commit suicide at their 101 Brazo Street house in Hillsborough and had to be rushed to DePaul Center and Waco for psychiatric treatment. On May 22nd, the day after Deborah attempted suicide at their family house, Filed court records revealed that the court was worried about putting her children under her care due to worries about her mental state. In the identical records, Jeter's husband filed for a divorce and asked the court to grant a temporary restraining order against his wife. He said that their daughters had been home when she attempted suicide. He also stated that Deborah was on a mental health warrant and was under care and supervision. The girl's father expressed further concern, saying, She may be released within a few days, and I am concerned about her possible actions regarding the children. The well-meaning father also requested custody of the children. In his words, he wanted to protect the safety and well-being of the children. Seeing reason with Lester, the court granted his temporary request while his estranged wife was still receiving care. Soon after, however, the court held a hearing to revisit the situation. In that hearing, the restraining order was lifted by the judge and Deborah was allowed to see her children again. Jeter's husband also agreed to the judge's verdict claiming that the mother of two showed no hate towards their children and that she had never caused either of them harm. Because it had been a while since the girls had seen their mother, they looked forward to seeing her after the judge's verdict of lifting the restraining order. The younger of the two, Kelsey, even took to her MySpace page on social media to express her excitement. She wrote, I get to see my mom tomorrow, yay. Little did she know what was to come. On June 5th, 2009, the day after the restraining order was lifted, the woman picked up 13-year-old Kirsten and 12-year-old Kelsey at 6 p.m. She told them she had prepared a surprise for them, and the girls hopped into their mother's car out of sheer excitement after saying goodbye to their father. A little after 9 p.m., three hours after the girls said goodbye to their father, and Deborah called 911, telling them that she had just killed her daughters. Her oldest daughter, Kristen, was heard slightly in the call's background. During the call, Deborah told the emergency operators that one of her daughters had died and that the other one wanted to be saved. Upon arriving at the scene, an abandoned ranch house on 215 U.S. Highway 77 in rural Hill County, the deputies found Jeter in the driveway with her hands raised into the air, holding a cell phone. Inside the building's bathroom, the authorities found the girls covered in blood. Their mother had cut their throats with a knife. The police also found a knife on the roof of Deborah's car in the garage. It turned out to be the same knife she had used in cutting her daughters. While one of the daughters was confirmed dead on the spot, a medical helicopter was on ground to fly Kristen, the survivor, to a Parkland hospital in Dallas. She was immediately taken in for surgery on arrival. On the other hand, Deborah was placed on suicide watch at Hill County Law Enforcement Center. During her trial, Deborah Janelle Jeter was charged with attempted capital murder and murder. The court set her bond at $1.5 million. After examining all the suspects of the case, Deborah was sentenced to life without parole on May 25, 2010, after taking a plea deal that spared her the possibility of a death sentence and spared her only surviving daughter from the trauma of having to take the stand and testify. To this day, the convicted Jeter woman continues to serve her sentence and some calls are unforgettable, regardless of the dispatcher. In June 2021, 
A Tennessee woman feared for her life when she called 911 and told them that Michael Louise Cadigan had FaceTimed her and showed her his ex-girlfriend's dead and beaten body. Police and Fire Communications, this is Portia. Hi, yes, my name is... I'm calling from Kingsport, Tennessee. Is this the High, high Point Sheriff's Department? No, this is the High Point Police Department. Police Department, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, I just left from the Kingsport Police Department reporting a murder that happened there in North Carolina this morning. And my friend, his name is Michael Cadogan, he called me this morning and he said that he had done something and I asked him what he had done and he FaceTimed me and turned the camera around and he had choked and beat his girlfriend to death. And he thinks that I'm going to pick him up and I've like played along with it so I could get more information for everybody. I told the police down here too. Uh, he is on his way right now to Watauga Lake and Rome Mountain here in Tennessee. Okay, and what part of this happened in High Point, though? I'm sorry? You think he murdered someone in High Point? It's around there. They told me, because no, I don't know the exact city. They told me, the Kingsport Police Department here told me to call High, High Point because it is around there. And they said, you can okay, what's the address? I do not have his exact address because what I had down, he had deleted me off of, and I cannot get back on those messages. Okay. Why do you think it's in High Point, though? Like, what what led you That's to that conclusion? Near. What's near High Point, okay. though? Where I went to, before to his house, I went through Salem, and right there, it was like after Salem, and it was like High Point's after, so I thought it might be near High Point. And that's what they told me to call. Okay, I, I don't understand. Why do you think it's Hot Point? Okay, so I've been to this person's house one time before, and I went through Salem. We don't. Do you mean Winston Salem? Yes. Okay, you went through Winston Salem. Yes, and it was. I, I, it was maybe like thirty minutes, an hour past that. I'm not sure exactly where it's at because it's been a while since I've been there. I do not talk to this person that much, and this is why I'm trying to get everything I can from him because he keeps calling me, and he is wanting me to pick him up from where he is dumping this girl at at this lake. Where is this lake at? In Tennessee? No. Yes. The name of it is Watauga Lake. It is near... Okay, do you, do, do you have any idea where it could be in High Point? Do you, was it at somebody's house? Was it at a hotel? Was it at a building? It was at, I'm sorry, I'm trying to thank you everything straight. It's at their, uh, it was at their apartment. Him and his girlfriend leased out an apartment together. And I know it happened in their apartment upstairs. That's all I know. Okay. Like where it, it's at. Mate, what is his name? Michael Cadogan. How do you spell his last name? I, oh, one second. I have to bring it up. It's very hard to spell. Okay, what's her name? I do not know her name. I never asked about her. Like, ever. And so it is C-A-D-O-G-A-N. And what was your name again? A phone number for you? And how old is Michael? He is 24, 25. Not how do you know him? I've met I met him through Snapchat a long time ago. I've known him for about five years. But you've never actually met him. You just know him online. No, I have met him. That's what I'm saying. I went to his house once before. Do you know what kind of car he drives? Yes, how are you? I know that he drives a black truck, but he's not in that. He is taking his girlfriend's car and her in the car and dumping it in the lake here at like at Wichita. Do you know what his cell phone number is? Yes, he, but he left it at the house, and he has a burner phone that he's been calling me from. Okay, well, do you have those numbers? 
Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, his cell phone number is... And what's the burner? It is... Are you sure this isn't... It's not a joke? No, I'm... Ma'am, I'm telling you, I, I'm scared for my own life because of how he ha is talking, and I've seen this girl with my own eyes over the phone. What did it? What did she look like? She was like, it was like there was a commotion around the room, and she was just laying there beside the bed, and he walked over there, and she, <laughs> she wasn't breathing. I told him to check for a pulse. I told him to do everything, and... What do you mean there was a commotion in the room? Commotion with who? Just him? Yeah, like, you know, we you see, like, someone has fought, like, things around the room. Okay. All right. Can you describe her? What does she look like? Was she white, black, Hispanic? She is white. Uh, she has curly blonde hair. Uh, I'm not sure about her eye color. I, I don't know for sure. But he said he strangled her to death. Yes. He told me that in his own words. Okay. Uh, let me work on this and I have somebody give you a call, okay? The caller had told the dispatcher that 24-year-old Michael Cadigan had admitted to choking and beating his ex-girlfriend, Gianna Rose Delgado, to death. The caller had allegedly met the man on Snapchat five years prior and told authorities that she had played along on the call to gather as much information as possible before going to the police. The killer was heading to Watauga Lake to dump both Delgado's body and her car in the lake when police stopped him. Police found the 19-year-old's body inside a tote bag in the car's trunk, just as the caller had said. Cadigan was arrested and booked into a local Tennessee jail under the charge of first-degree murder and the abuse of a corpse. He's being held without bond. Ricardo Delgado, the victim's father, had demanded the death penalty for the man who murdered his daughter in cold blood. Ricardo said the recent High Point University student had broken off a romantic relationship with Cadigan, but the two continued living together. Ricardo stated that this had concerned him. We talked about getting a restraining order and my daughter didn't want to cause any type of harm because she wanted to save the world, Ricardo stated. Ricardo also told the court that Cadigan would exploit and abuse his daughter's love for her dog, Franklin, by threatening and kidnapping him. Franklin is now under Ricardo's care. A new court date is yet to be set for the killer, but police say that he will be charged in High Point with first degree murder and felony concealment of death. Friends of Delgado remember her fondly as a fun-loving and kind-hearted, spirited young woman with an infectious smile who had so much potential. She was working towards a law degree when she was taken far too soon. In May 2021, Everton Brown set his house on fire and shot three of his neighbors dead in Baltimore's early morning murder spree. Baltimore County, 911 was the address of the emergency. I have this nearby by Kelly's Court in Campwell Road. Yes, and actually the Kelly's Court address is closer to where something is going on. It dragged me out of bed, somebody banging in somebody's front door, and then I just heard three gunshots. I see a man standing in the door, posed with a weapon in his hand, and uh, I don't know what he did to get in there because it jarred me out of bed, and I'm about three or four down, doors down. Okay, and... and just give me that location again to make sure I have it correctly. My address is... You can't miss it when you come up the street, though, because, uh, like I said, I don't know what he did to get in there. It, I was sound asleep, and it just jarred me out of my bed. Yes, ma'am. Can you give me a description of him? I can't, couldn't see him from here. Can not see him? Once I saw him with the gun, and uh, I came back in the house and locked my door. Okay. Well, we do got a call and sis before that. We got help on the way there, okay? <laughs> what is the address of the emergency? Hold on, Mama. No problem. Hello? Baltimore County, 911. What is the address we, we of the emergency? We just, we just had a house blow up, and the, and the house next to it is on fire. It's on a house, a house exploded. A house exploded? Yes. Okay, the what's the address? Exploded. We don't know. Okay, what's the closest intersection? Um, um, Fairbrook and Johnny Cake Road. Is what street is the house on? Murray, Murray Road. Murray Road. Murray Road. Yes. All right. Yes. Take a deep breath for me, okay? 
Oh my gosh, all we had was pop, 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 and then the house blew up. Okay. Oh my God. And Murray Road, what's the closest intersection to where the house is located? Uh, Kelly's Lane. Kelly's Lane? Yeah. Okay. It's it's Kelly's Court. Court. Okay. I'm sorry, it's Kelly's Court. Kelly's Court. Kelly's Court and Murray Road. And the second house is on fire. I'm so sorry, but the house, the house is burning really bad. Okay, take like, a really, deep breath for me, okay? And there's one guy who lives in there. Oh, my God. We don't see him. We don't see him. All right, and just repeat oh, that intersection oh. back to make sure that I have it correct. We heard the gun. We, we heard gunfire. Okay. Oh. Okay, what's your my, name? My name is... I just so happen to be... In the house. I just don't have so, Okay, Miss, Miss, I need you to listen to I'm me for sorry. one second. I know you're upset, but I need to get information from you. Okay. I want to make sure okay. I heard you. You said you heard gunfire and then a house exploded and it's on fire. Yes. Yes. And there's a victim on the ground. Who's got a victim on the ground shot? Okay. We got a victim on the ground. Okay. A female, and she's got blood all in front of her. Okay, is she breathing? I don't know. She's just lying on the ground. Okay. She doesn't look like she's moving. She's not moving. She's not moving. Okay. We got help. We got a lot of help coming to you, okay? What's the phone number that you're calling from? Uh, my daughter's phone number. Uh, okay. It's <laughs> the desk. Oh. And do you see anybody with the gun? I need you to get to safety right now. We're in the house. We're Miss, I need you to get in the house, close the door, and duck below the windows. He blew up his house. I understand that he blew up his house, but I need you to get to safety right now. Brown believed that drones were following him. He thought the FBI was breaking into his house to feed his dog and worried the authorities were tampering with his computer. Some of these claims were posted to his YouTube account. It's a little after 6.30. I'm at Sam's Club in Ellicott, not Sam's Club, I'm at Walmart in Ellicott City. This is, this is a plane here that's flying, you know, monitoring me. Two of them crossed right in front of each other. It made me want to really document it. Where's the other one? I'm gonna stick this, this one here. This is one here, flying real low, slow, coming over Walmart, wow. Okay, there's they another one coming over the building now. Let's see, you are here. See if I can find you coming over the building. Over top of the building, come on. This is the third one. one, one already went the other way. According to Baltimore County Police, Brown called more than 100 times over the past 24 years. Based on some of the, the behavior that we know this individual was um, you know, engaged in in the past, um, encounters he had with our police officers, comments that he made to our officers as well as neighbors, I, I certainly think that, that we can infer that he had some type of mental illness. Um, as for what his specific diagnosis or diagnoses were, that I don't know right now. His neighbors also called the police, reporting that the man harassed them and yelled from his porch through a bullhorn. It was like it was uh, something going on with him. He just, at that point, he just kept on coming at us every day. I could be taking the trash out, going to the mailbox, going to work, come back from the store. He had to say something to me or my family. Brown's actions continued until they had tragic consequences. At 6.39 a.m. on May 8th, the 56-year-old set fire to his home, sparking an explosion, and then shot and killed three neighbors. Police body cam footage from the shooting showed officers arriving on the scene and finding the suspect standing next to his car. A red van with a poster proclaiming black people are the tool used to maintain racism, shooting at his neighbors. Police officers warned the man to drop the gun as they fired at him until they ultimately hit him. Authorities recovered a handgun, knife, and several homemade explosive devices from Brown's home. The officers found victims Sarah Alicote and Sagar Gimeyer outside their homes with bullet wounds. The third victim, Ismail Quintanilla, was found inside his home suffering from stab and gunshot wounds. All three died from their injuries. 
Baltimore County Fire spokesperson Tim Rostkowski said the building where the fire started and one adjacent to it collapsed, and a third was heavily damaged. Neighbors a couple of homes down also felt the impact of the fire. It swayed like if it was a tree branch. The whole house shook, went from side to side, and things in my house was falling out the cabinets and doors and stuff was hitting the wall. It, it just, it was hard. Brown died en route to the hospital. The officers who discharged their firearms were placed on administrative leave. On the evening of April 1st, 2009, Marcus Luttrell heard a gunshot. After ensuring that his mother was okay inside the house, he went outside and saw Daisy, his golden retriever, dead from a gunshot wound to her left shoulder. Okay, why are you chasing? Are you chasing him because he shot your dog? I think, yeah. You're, that's right. Do you know who these people are? I have no idea. Okay, what kind of vehicle are they in? It's a, uh, a burgundy, it looks like a Toyota Camry. A burgundy yeah, Toyota Camry? No, no, like a, like a old champagne wine colored Camry. They just drove up to your house and shot your dog and left? Yep. That's what woke me up. And then they came back and... Do you know what kind of gun it was? Was it a pistol or a shotgun? I don't know. Which way are you headed? How oh, yeah, we're about to call the railroad track. You're passing the railroad track? Yes, ma'am. How, tra how fast are you traveling? Going 80 miles an hour. We're just we're coming over the railroad track right now. You're just now the railroad track? Yeah. What is your name? Marcus Luttrell. You know, we took a ride towards Phelps. You took a ride towards Phelps? Yeah. You better get somebody out here, because they got a gun, and I got one, too, so this is going to a gunfight. Okay, hold on one second. <laughs> okay, sir, what kind of, do you have a gun with you? Yes, ma'am. Okay, you, what kind of gun do you have? I got, a, I got two 9 millimeter Berettas. All right, we're going to our house now, yeah, 22. Okay, which way are y'all going right now? We're going north. Speed's approximately 95 miles an hour. Okay, sir, I don't want you to speed to try to keep up with them. We have officers that's coming that way right now. All right, we're coming over the railroad tracks right now. Okay, where, which way is he going? We're still heading, uh, still heading kind of northeast bound. We just came over the railroad track towards Phelps, and uh, we're coming to the sea in the intersection. Which way is he going at the T? I don't know. We ain't got that yet. There? Yes, sir. I'm here. I'm trying to talk to my officer. officer. Yeah. We're going about 110 miles an hour now. Okay. Well, I, I don't want you to drive 110 miles an hour because you've well, I'm not letting these guys go. They're just murdering my dog. You don't pass the bill. I still on the same road. Have you passed the Valero? No, we haven't passed the Valero yet. It's up in the distance, though. I mean, uh, we're at it right now. You're passing the Valero? Yeah. Where are y'all at right now? We just passed the Valero. So he didn't turn off? No, he's still on it. How fast are y'all going right now? Which way? What's that? How fast are y'all traveling right now? I understand. Hold on just one second. I'm going to pack Sam to sit on the line with this because you're basically leave our county. Hold on one second. <laughs> just let me know the next thing that y'all pass so I can let them know. Yeah, my mama fucking here emergency. This is Walker County with a transfer. Are you familiar with what's going on? Uh, yes, ma'am. Just a moment. Okay. <laughs> Okay, sir, well, I don't need you to keep up with them. I don't want you to hurt yourself by raking or anything. I'm not going to hurt myself. Thing. I'm like, hey, listen, man, I've been a, I'm a Navy SEAL. I've been for 10 years. I'm not worried about hurting yeah, myself. I know what I'm doing. Have you caught him to San Jacinto? No. That's clear, sir. From Polk County. Sir? You want Polk County, you said? Um, yes, ma'am. Sir, from Polk 
County, our office is not going to make it time. Okay, I don't have it. Can you transfer me? I can get more information. Thank you. Sheriff's office, please take. Sir, stay on the phone with me, okay? Yeah. Right, hang on just a second. We're going to try to get somebody ahead of you to tell their travels so fast. Hello, County 911. What is your emergency? This is Walker County with a transfer. We have two callers that are uh, traveling at about 110 miles an hour in Yaws County. One subject shot the other guy's dog. Okay, where are they driving? Sir, are you there? Yeah, one's a, a Toyota Camry, later model, champagne color. I already gave her the license plate number. There's three, three, three people in it, two in the front seat, one in the back. <laughs> They have right. a weapon as well as the caller that's on the line has two weapons with them also. If you would warn your deputy, if you can get them stopped, we can okay. come over there. What road are they coming in on? Sir, what are y'all passing now? Nothing. We're out in the middle of nowhere. I just want us to know the, the next thing around you, building your city thing around you so we can let everybody know. That's it. It's all wooded. Okay, the next thing, let me know when you come up to the Oakhurst Fire Department. They just transferred you since they're, they're traveling about 110, and he's refusing to stop. What is your name? Marcus Luttrell. We were fa I'm passing a uh, First Baptist Church on my right. Okay, you see any street signs or anything? What's that? You see any street signs? Uh, I just pulled into point play. We just pulled into point blank. Now tell me again what happened with yeah, the uh, hilltop. I just passed the hilltop. Uh, okay. Beer, beer what, joint. What did this guy do? Shot my dog. Okay. All right, we'll come into town. And what color is the Toyota? It's a champagne. On the last, it's four miles up from us. How fast are y'all driving? I'm going 100, they're going about 110, 112. Alright, we're at point blank. Just crossed over a bridge. Did you cross over the big bridge? Yes, ma'am. Somebody anywhere near these guys? Yes, sir. Can you come into on the last one? Yeah, we're in. Well, I'm actually five miles out of Alaska. Excuse me. I'm, I just, I'm in point blank right now. Point blank. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're, they're waiting on you in Alaska. Okay. Alaska. We're on our way. Out there about a quarter mile in front of me. I'm going to get some crap on a big pickup. I can't really keep up with them. But uh, I still got their tail light. Over the big bridge. We're at Polk, Polk River, I guess, or Polk, whatever. Yeah, Lake Livingston. Right. Trinity River. Yeah. How far? I'm not sure if I got to do this. Not, not very far. Hey, tell your boy, I'm speed passing, right? Well, let slow down, let him get behind yeah. him. All right. Yeah, he's not trying to pass me. And we're here because they stopped. Okay. I'm going to stay on the phone with you until everybody gets stopped and we make sure things going okay. Yeah. Are you stopped? Yes, ma'am. Is he stopped? Yes, ma'am. They're behind you. Okay. We've got two of the suspects out on the knees in front of so far. Third guy with your hand, got his hands in the air. Three guys out here and me, another cop. He might want to send another unit. Not far from his home, he noticed a suspicious vehicle parked along the side of the road, which he suspected held those responsible. Latrell jumped into his car and began pursuing the men. He called 911 during the chase and remained on the line with a dispatcher as he followed the suspect's vehicle. He was still recovering from recent surgery, but that didn't stop him from attempting to catch the fleeing suspects. Latrell chased the men's car eastward from Walker County, where the vehicle was stopped by Onalaska police just north of Lake Livingston in Polk County. 
According to the Rangers, the shooting was the latest in a series of five dog killings in an area Luttrell describes as the middle of nowhere. His beloved Daisy was given to him by America's vet dogs to help him emotionally recover from his experiences in the Middle East. He named the pup Daisy, an acronym for the names of his fellow SEALs, the ones that didn't survive the battle. According to court documents, Michael Edmonds and Alfonso Hernandez were riding in a car on Four Notch Road in southeast Walker County when Edmonds shot Daisy as she chased the vehicle. Hernandez allegedly got out of the car, beat the animal with a bat. The two men were charged with cruelty to a non-livestock animal while the car's driver was cited for not having a valid license. Police records show that they had been linked to at least five other area killings in the months leading up to the shooting. Edmonds pleaded guilty to the charges against him and received five years probation. Hernandez chose to stand trial, was found guilty, and received the maximum sentence of two years in state prison. He was also fined $1,000. Luttrell said losing Daisy was a massive setback, but thankfully, he soon had another therapy dog in his life, another yellow lab named Rigby. Seventy-three-year-old Joseph Melvin DeRoches told the 911 operator that he shot his son's dog and wife in March 2014. He continued to say to the operator that he thinks he is insane. He was charged with murder. 911 emergency. Do you need police, fire, or ambulance? Uh, police. You have a police, sir. How can I help you? Uh, there was two shots fired at the 911... Er, sorry. Uh... That's okay. Nine, uh, two shots fired at uh, seven seven five one Cameo Street. That's where you live. Yeah. You heard two shots. Yeah. Who shot? Send the police. They're on the way. Did somebody use a gun, sir? Yes. Who did? It was me. Who did you shoot? Somebody? Yes. Who did you shoot? Uh, I shot my son's dog, and I shot my wife. <laughs> okay. Does she need an ambulance, or is she dead? I don't know. Okay. Are you okay? Are you Mr. Roach? Yeah. Okay. What kind of gun do you have, sir? I have a 9 millimeter German Luger. A 9 millimeter German Luger? And where are you in the house? I'm in the kitchen. Okay. We've got help on the way. I won't, uh, I won't put up a struggle. I'll, I'll have the front door open. Where's the gun now? It's uh, on the fireplace by the front door. Where did you shoot your wife? In the bedroom. You're going to come to the front door? Uh, I'll be at the front door. I'll be waiting. Okay, you're going to keep me on the phone though until we get there because there's going to be a whole process on how we get you out of the house, okay? Wife, was she in bed? Uh, yes. Okay, where did you shoot her on her body, though? I, I don't know. I shot through the blanket, or in the chest area, I think. Why did you do this? I, I don't know. I, Are you suffering some medical issues, sir? Is she? No, me. No, okay. You have some medical issues? Okay. We're going to try to get some help to your wife as soon as we can, okay? Here's your son home, too? No, he doesn't live here. Okay, but it was his dog, eh? Yeah. Okay. Is the dog alive still? No. I just don't want him to get up and try biting somebody. Okay. Uh. Okay, so we're going to have a lot of people coming around to the to the house there, but I do need to keep you because you don't want to you don't want to get yourself um, hurt or anything here. 
What's your name, sir? Uh, Mel. Mel. You know, I'm, okay. What's her name? Uh, Rosa. Rosa? Is there anybody else in the house, just the two of you? No, just the two of us. Okay. How you doing, bud? Been having a rough time? Mm. Have you been drinking? No. No. You ever had a problem with the police before? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Anything else you want to tell me right now? I think I'm. I think I'm insane. Why do you think that? Have you guys, have you and your wife been having problems before recently? No, no. It's all, it's all me. It's all in my head. It's all me. Have you ever had, um, have you got a doctor that you can talk to? I have a family doctor. Dr. Frazier is my family doctor. What's up? Is there any other pets in the house? Any other dogs or anything? No. Just the one? What kind of dog was it? Uh, Mastiff, Bulldog, Pitbull combination. And where is that in the house? Where's what? Where was the dog? Like where would you? In the backyard. Okay. By the back door. Like outside though? Yes. Okay. Have you had any mental health issues prior to this, sir? Uh. Any other, you know, do you hear things? Have you had different thoughts prior to today? All many times. Many yeah. Times. And again, have you talked to somebody about that? I was hospitalized a few years ago for a week. In, at like World Jubilee? No, no, this is when I was stationed in New York. So you're a veteran? Yeah, military. So you were hospitalized in Europe for mental health issues? Sort of, yeah. Oh. Tough being in the military. Where were you in Europe? I was in the northern part and in Lar. In Lar? Yeah. My dad was in Lar, too. How old are you? 71. So it was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. Do you suffer from PTSD, do you know? No. No? Okay. Okay, the police are here. Can you see them? Okay, well, you don't go out there until I tell you, okay, because they're going to have their weapons drawn, and I don't want you getting yourself into any more trouble. Okay. Before the dreadful events of March 18, 2014 that ended with the shooting of 77-year-old Rosa Maria de Roches, there had been no previous history of violence between the couple. The act that was described by Crown Prosecutor Patrick Weir as aberrant and completely out of character was a shock to those who knew the family. To neighbors and friends, the four-decade-long marriage looked healthy and happy, but it was discovered that there had been underlying strains on the couple. Allegedly, DeRoches had a difficult childhood growing up. He was the youngest of 20 children in Prince Edward Island. He only completed his education to grade 6. He became a part of the Canadian forces at the young age of 17, during which his long and renowned career led him to serve with the forces in Europe. It was then that he met his wife Rosa in Spain. 
According to the men's defense attorney, Ray Diano, neither of the couple's grown children, Daniel and Kim, wrote victim impact statements. The children stood behind their father, even though they were also victims in the case as they had essentially lost both of their beloved parents. The killer, who had no memory of ever planning to hurt his wife, could not give a reason as to why he did what he did on March 18th. He confessed guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 10 years. 10 years was the minimum sentence, and it was agreed between defense and prosecution that this was the correct sentence to give. The last meal of a marriage ended with an Australian man waking up in a gassed vehicle. In the early hours of February 1, 2015, Dean Yarton woke up alone to the hissing of an open gas cylinder. He quickly dialed triple zero for assistance. Unbeknownst to him, his wife had just tried to blow him up in their car. Police emergency, my name's Dave. Are you a Southern police station, mate? Yeah, mate, this is police triple zero. Did you need the police where you are? Sorry, mate? This is police triple zero. Did you need the police where you are? Well, yeah, thanks, mate. Yeah, whereabouts are you? Wait, I, I don't know. All I know is I've got to, I've got to, I, I'm a, mate, I, I've just come over with the missus. I'm asleep in the car. I've woken up. There's fuel all around the car and two gas bottles in the car. And I'm on the road going to Soto, uh, I don't know, there's a national park sign ahead there, mate. Do you know what actual road it is that you're on? Or? I wouldn't have a clue, mate. All right. So you can see what... Does it say what national park it is, or...? And this f***ing lunatic has just turned up, mate. What lunatic? The wife. Or ex wife to be, mate. Alright, so... Oh, what else can you see around you, Sorry, mate? What else can you see around you? Well, mate, I, 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 I'm in the road. It's dark. It's the start of the car. One second. Mate, I'll bring you back, buddy. Well, no point... Hello. Yeah, it's the police. How are you, mate? I'm very well. So, the, how did you get there? Sorry, mate. So, so, what's happened? You've woken up in the car. Well, mate, I've woken up in the car. Yeah. The wife has suddenly, I don't know, she's just pulled into the f***ing toilet. Wife! 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 I've woken up, mate. There's fuel all around the f***ing car. There's two... Uh, empty gas bottles in the back of the car, and yes. she's apparently herself and in the fucking bushes, mate. You're yeah. Mate, look, I'll solve this, mate. Well, I need right. to know where you are. Oh, I, I couldn't tell you, mate. I've got, got a f***ing dark road with no f***ing lights, mate. Does so, so she know where she is? Oh, she would have a f***ing clue, mate. Well, she it's got okay, you there. Mate. I'm sorted, mate. Oh, well, no, know. not technically, you're not sorted. Well, I'm not, mate. I'm right. You tell me. I'll, I'll sort it, mate. Seriously. What was your name? After nearly 23 years of marriage, Sharon and Dean Yarton planned one last meal before they went their separate ways. The couple invited their friends over to a dinner at the Maryland's Bowling Club. During their night out, Sharon went to buy beers for them. According to Dean, when he tasted the beer, he noticed that it tasted unusual and he felt like there were granules on the lip of the glass. Sharon offered to take the beer back to the bar where CCTV footage shows her pouring the beer into another glass and returning to their table. Dean allegedly drank some of that beer and afterwards started to feel extremely tired. As Sharon drove her husband home, he fell asleep in the passenger seat. At about 1 a.m., Dean woke in the passenger seat and heard a hissing sound coming from an open gas bottle in the car and found his socks drenched in petrol. His wife was nowhere in sight. When Dean rang his wife, she said she was cleaning herself after going to the toilet in the nearby bushes. Sharon was arrested at the scene. She insisted that there was no plot to kill her ex-husband. Oh, he said he was going to smack him and say to him, listen, your missus loves you. Um, and I laughed, I said, look, it's not gonna work. I said, he's been brooding behind my back for four years. When police investigators searched the crime scene, they found a lighter and a glove near the car. 
Crown prosecutor Guy Newton told the jury Sharon was a jilted ex-wife who was having an affair with one of their colleagues. The relationship caused tension and animosity between the couple. They separated but continued to live together in their Minai home, south of Sydney, while it was being sold. Newton alleged that the accused had recruited old friends of her sons, Anthony Maltheris, Monique Hayes, and the young woman's husband, Fadi Huda, to kill her husband, offering them $20,000 to carry out the murder plot. According to the prosecutor, the glove found near the vehicle contained DNA consistent with Huda. They all denied the allegations. Michael Picken, a defense barrister for Huda, argued that his client was not involved in any plot to murder Dean. Judge Jane Culver sentenced the plotters Hayes for six years and six months with a non-parole period of four years. Huda and Maltheris were sentenced to 11 years and six months with a non-parole period of seven years and 10 months. Speaking outside court, Mr. Yarton told reporters that he was just happy it was all over, but obviously felt very lucky to be alive. I'm just happy it's all over, so that chapter's now closed, let's just move on now. A late night altercation between a couple ended in tragedy when the woman was thrown from a moving Lamborghini. Okay, what's the telephone number you're calling from? Tell me exactly what happened. Um, there's a great Lamborghini that was driving. There's a fight, there's an altercation. I guess the Lamborghini took off and she was thrown out from the car out the top of the roof. They like pushed her out. Wrong from out of their um, vehicle roof? Yeah. Right to the right to the roof. They threw out, yeah, they threw out the car. Yeah. All right. Are you with the patient now? Bull run. Bull run. Yeah, I'm calling it right now. They said the tag. You, the tag is bull run. Okay. What are you with the patient now? Uh, yes. I got my girlfriend. Some people. There's people all around attending her right now. Okay. How old is the patient? How old is she? Twenty-nine. Twenty-nine. Okay. Is she awake? Uh, maybe breathing, breathing though, unconscious, maybe. Okay, she is, but she is conscious, she is breathing. So she is conscious and she is breathing? Yeah, uh, yeah, she's, she's breathing. When did this happen? Uh, about like two minutes ago. Is there any serious bleeding? Yeah, three minutes ago. Is that the wind right there? I know. That was it right there. They just went that way. It, the limbo's going is down near 400 right is now. Is she completely alert there? On Piedmont Road right now. It's towards 400. Is she completely alert? Uh, is it, that was the car that just went by. Uh, she's, she's in a white Lamborghini. Um, she's breathing. She's laying down. Could be conscious, though. Okay. What part of the, ba what part of the body was injured? Uh, she has, she's unconscious right now. His blood. So she's she's unconscious. Yeah. Okay. Caller, go ahead. Hi. I was calling. Caller, to help tell, me, yeah. tell me exactly what's happened. I don't know. It's to tell the people in the street, and somebody is like screaming, and I think people are running off that hit the person. And I'm cool. pulling up right now, and that's even okay. police officer. Right, give me one moment. And Mia, like, it's really bad right now. I understand. We already have help on the way. Atlanta starts. I just called for y'all. I'm 7943. I have PD and fire started. Thank you. Oh, my God. All right. What, tell me exactly what you're seeing and hearing. What has happened, ma'am? Somebody just got hit by a car, and I don't know if they're conscious or not, but there's a lot of people that pulled over on the side of the street to help them. Okay. Give me one moment for me. I don't know. But the police, he was just here. I don't know where he was. Don't, don't hang up the phone, okay? Stay on the line for me. I'm not. I'm, I'm standing in the middle of the street with a bunch of other people trying to help him or her. Junior, get in the car. Are you with the patient now, ma'am? Yeah, somebody's trying to, like, help them right now. Give me one more. I don't know if they're free. The people that hit them just ran away, though, so I don't know. There's a bunch of other people in the street trying to help them, but I see the police officer. Just stay on the line with me. Don't hang up, okay? I'm Wait, not. I need. Are you, are you with the patient now? 
Yes, we are. But well, y'all need to get a paramedic, right? Like ASAP. We we already have them on the way. I do need to get okay. some further information from you. I need you to be, need you to answer to the best of your ability. Okay. Okay. I didn't see Give me one moment. Saw people laying on the street. I just wanted to help them, but I didn't see the actual accident. I understand. Give me one moment. Okay, so, 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 um, it was a gray Lambo. There was an altercation at the Red Factoria. Uh, I, I went off and I saw her in like the front seat of the Lambo. The Lambo went right by me. Then they threw her out the car, up the, up the, up the top of the roof. Okay. And give me she landed on the road. Give me one second. And, uh, okay, sorry. Okay. Um, are you with the patient now? Uh, yeah, there's people with her right now. Okay, how, how old is she? Uh, about 29, I believe. Okay, is, is she awake? Uh, no, she's unconscious. Is she breathing? She's breathing, no. she's breathing yeah. Okay, all right, give me one moment. Don't hang up. Give me one moment. All right, is the assailant still nearby? Um, no, they, they took off. Okay. They went down near, they went near down Piedmont Road at 400. All right, I'm saying the paramedics to help. I'm saying the paramedics to help you now. Stand the line. I'll tell you exactly what to do next. Okay. Uh, give me one moment. I just want to confirm. PD, you're advising that PD's on scene. Sir. I'm sorry. I'm just confirming that you're advising that PD is on scene. Correct. Uh, yes, PD is here. Okay. All right. Give me one moment. I'm gonna give you some instructions. Um, who is this? Don't you think you're not breathing? Sorry, officer, you're not doing CPR? No, sir. I'm sorry. I think she stopped breathing. Yes. Okay, if you stop breathing, there's an officer on scene. I need someone to start doing yes, CPR. I'm going to give you instructions, okay? Put okay. Put me on speaker. Put me on speaker. I'm going to give you some instructions. Okay. Put me on speaker. I'm saying the paramedics to help you now. I'm going to tell you exactly what to do next, okay? All right, listen to me, listen to me very carefully. I'm going to uh -huh. give you guys instructions. I understand there's an officer on scene, but I need someone to take over the scene and do CPR, okay? Are you right by her now? Yeah, right by her right now. Okay, is, is the officer doing CPR at this time? No, it's, it's, two, it's two civilians right now. Okay, it's two civilians doing CPR. Listen yeah. very carefully. Make sure we're doing this correctly. I need, I need, I need yeah. everyone to be listening to me, okay? Lay her flat on her back on the ground and remove anything Ooh. under her head. Okay. Make sure she is flat on her back on the ground and remove anything under her head. Oh, yeah, they put a blanket. They put a uh, video over there. Place the okay. heel of your hand on the breastbone in the center of the chest, right between the nipples. Put the uh, put your other hand on top of that hand. Again, place the heel of your hand on the breastbone in the center of the chest, right between the nipples, and put the other hand on top of that hand. Okay. Uh, the fire department, okay, the fire department might still be getting out of their truck. I want you to let me know when they're right there with her. I'm going to still read these instructions. Go ahead and continue to do CPR until they until they get there. Okay? Sir, what is going on? Uh, the fire, fire truck got here and everything. They're telling everyone to come, they're telling them to come on. On October 10th, 2021, 28-year-old Catherine Kahn was ejected from a moving Lamborghini in Buckhead. Police then tried to determine if she was pushed out of the moving car or if she jumped out to escape an argument. That night, Khan started fighting with a man who, according to social media videos, she accused of attempting to steal her things, including the car. At some point, they both got into the luxury vehicle, where police say the altercation continued. Paramedics rushed her to Grady Memorial Hospital, but doctors sadly couldn't save the 28-year-old's life. One of the witnesses spoke about when the incident happened. No, we ran over literally flagging out guards. I didn't care if I was gonna get hit because I wanted to make sure she was gonna get the help she needed. Left her on the road. 
me and my boyfriend were just waving down cars so they wouldn't hit the people that were trying to resuscitate her. She had a pulse and then she didn't. <laughs> just blind down on the ground, bloody. Her parents said they couldn't come to terms with the loss of their daughter, but found some solace in knowing she would bless two babies with the precious gift of life through organ donation. She loved kids, she loved animals, she just was a giver. She just always gave her time and her energy and her love and she loved family gatherings. She just, she just thrived on it. That's my baby. I can't have my daughter back, you know? I cannot get my daughter back. And what happened to my daughter, I don't want this to happen to any other girl. A week later, 31-year-old Alfred McBulyaba turned himself into the Fulton County Jail and was charged with felony murder, theft by taking, and financial transaction card theft. His attorney said they expect the evidence to show Khan may have been intoxicated and jumped or fell out of the vehicle on her own accord. Meanwhile, the Khan family has hired civil rights attorney L. Chris Stewart to investigate her death. A judge found the accused driver a danger to the community, saying he posed a flight risk. Additionally, since there is a connection to some of the witnesses who might be called to testify in the trial, Meg Bulyaba would remain in Fulton County Jail due to being an intimidation risk. In August 2022, he rejected a plea deal that would have sent him to prison for 15 years, so the case against him will move forward instead. The trial date has not been announced. In December 2019, Alec Butt attacked his ex-wife, Anna Butt, slashing her face with a hammer and a screwdriver in Clifton. It is believed that his harrowing act was punishment for her leaving him. Someone's being attacked behind my showroom. I'm on White Ladies Road. White Ladies Road? What's happening there? Somebody's screaming behind my showroom. I think someone's being attacked. Okay. Just, are you okay? Oh my God! What's going on? There's a, someone's being attacked! Okay, can you tell me what's going on, please? Can you tell me what's going on? There's a, there's a man attacking, attacking a lady. Okay, so what is going on? Is anybody injured? Pardon? Is anybody injured? No, they're being attacked. I'm watching him hit her. Okay, I just need to understand. Are there any weapons involved? I, I think so. Exactly He's oh my God! Okay, can you, yeah, I'm trying to get someone there, but I need to know exactly what's going on. Can you tell someone, me exactly a man is attacking a woman quite violently what behind my showroom. What are you attacking her with? I don't know. It's quite dark. He's pushing and punching and saying, can I get, a, can I get, I can't want this. We're no, having the police to, on their way. I need to on the phone. I need a description. Can you tell me? He's wearing a hoodie. He's dragging the woman. It's his ex, her ex-husband. He's going mad. He's, he's ripping her face to shreds. He's not screaming. I think he's got a knife. He's smashing her in the face. I can just, I'm just, okay. he's really hurting her. Can I go and intervene or not? Okay, no, don't intervene, no. Keep safe. I'm going to get one of my colleagues to bring ambulance. Uh, we'll be a second. He's put a hoodie up. He's wearing... Six go into my showroom. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! She's, you need, need to an ambulance immediately. Alec and Anna Budd had been married for 18 years. And in 2018, Mrs. Budd had reported to police a real fear he might assault her and had reportedly taken many measures to avoid any attacks at her home. Later in court proceedings, it was said that Mr. Butt had brooded in an unfurnished home, fueled by anger and resentment, and was envious of Anna's new relationship with a man he had described as the odd job man. The 71-year-old businessman had attempted to conceal his face with a hoodie and a mask, but witnesses recognized the man as he brutally attacked his wife. He reportedly crept up on her from behind the bins in the car park outside her workplace on White Ladies Road. Shortly after 5 p.m., he jumped her and proceeded to hit her head against the wall and floor as well as smash her face multiple times with a hammer and a screwdriver. The attack did not stop until Alec heard a witness calling the police and ran away. He reportedly fled from the scene before police arrived, but was located 90 minutes later sitting in a car in a park near Cribs Causeway. Alec allegedly denied being involved in the attack on his ex-wife, but he was arrested for the crime. He was, however, bailed out following the offense and permitted to visit the greater Bristol area. There was an explicit exclusion zone surrounding Mr. Butt's home. 
Mrs. Budd was rushed to a nearby hospital where she was treated for her injuries. In the victim's statement, Anna said that she had been terrified in the attack and believed that she would die in that car park. She also mentioned that it was hard for her to tell her children what their father had done to their mother and why she needed to keep herself and her children away from him as the case continued. The trial was postponed to March 2021 due to the global coronavirus pandemic. Alec Butt was sentenced to seven years in prison for his violent assault and for causing grievous bodily harm. Anna made a full physical recovery, but has bravely spoken out about how the attack has taken a toll on her own mental health and that of her family. There are days when my anxiety is so high that I can't face leaving the house. She also urged people suffering from domestic abuse and violence to contact authorities and get the help that they need. A dramatic and harrowing phone call was made to 999 in August 2016 by Carrie Keogh discovering an eight-month pregnant woman covered in blood after she had been stabbed in the throat by her fiancé. Hello? Right, mate, we do need, we need serious help here. Right, there's is nice someone in blood there? Everywhere. Is there someone in there? Yeah, there's someone in there. Hello? Right, ask her what happened. Are you okay? We've got nothing. I'm going to come in. You haven't got anything, have you? Oh, we need serious help here. Right, what's happening inside? Are you okay? Oh, my good God. What's happening? What's happening? She's very, she's, she's, what? Like she's having some sort of fit. She's having a fit. She can't breathe. She's bleeding from her right, mouth. Okay, listen, listen. You need to take a deep breath for me. Leave her to fit for the moment. All right. Is there anybody else in that room? No, just her. But just I don't her. Think it, yeah. Right. Okay. Just leave her for the moment. Make sure everything around no, her. I right, think her throat. Listen, cut. her throat's been cut. I think so. Yeah. It looks like it. she's really it bleeding open? from her mouth. Hello? Okay, so, so look, I mean... You can't breathe. Oh, what, what am I going to do okay, here? Okay, listen, oh, listen. If she's fitting, you need to leave her to fit for the second, all right? Just make sure uh, everything around her is away yeah. from her so she can't knock herself, okay? Okay, Just yeah. for the moment. We've okay. got someone on their way to you. We're going to get another okay. ambulance as well, all right? So okay. there's two patients. There's definitely nobody else in definitely that room. two patients, yeah. There's a definitely knife on the floor. Right. There's, um, it looks like they've had some sort of altercation. Oh, she's pregnant. She's pregnant? She's pregnant, yeah. But when she's she listens to me, when she stops fitting, okay, you need to leave her on her left-hand side, okay? Hello? Roll her Hello? on her side. According to authorities, a passerby, Mr. Kiyog, who saved the life of the woman and her unborn child, had initially heard shouting coming from their Edmonton Green home in North London and found Peter Petrov lying on the ground outside of the building surrounded by glass. It looked as if he had been thrown through the first floor window. It was later discovered that the jealous and possessive father-to-be had attacked his fiancée before slitting his wrists and jumping out of the first floor in an attempt to end his life. Petrov and Campos had met while they both worked at the Rembrandt Hotel in South Kensington, where Petrov was an assistant head chef and Campos was a room attendant. Petrov had recently been suspended from work as he acted violently towards a male colleague who allegedly made a joke about Campos that angered Petrov. The couple had been romantically involved for just over a year when the incident occurred. After performing first aid on the man, Mr. Keogh then reportedly went into the apartment and found 30-year-old Anna Campos lying on the floor with life-threatening injuries. With the telephonic assistance of emergency services, he managed to perform first aid on her as well before paramedics arrived and she was rushed to hospital and placed in intensive care. Petrov was taken to Royal London Hospital where he was later arrested and charged with attempted murder. The 31-year-old Bulgarian hotel worker was sentenced at Old Bailey the following year and imprisoned for 21 years. Although her life was saved, the victim remained in a vegetative state with what doctors describe as very little chance of ever regaining consciousness. By some miracle, however, the baby survived the ordeal. In July 2014, Randy Budd from Union County, Pennsylvania, called 911 to report that his wife's head had been smashed by a rock thrown through the windshield of their family car. Oh my God! Something right through the windshield. Hi, uh, we're, I'm on the highway, uh, Route 80. Something just came through my windshield and it hit my wife, and I think it went right through her head. Oh my God! Can you please get get can you get an ambulance somewhere? Can you track this phone? Where on Interstate 80 are you? Oh, 
Oh my God! What? Are you going east or westbound? Uh, we we're going uh, uh west. You're going westbound. I'm sorry. What are you driving, sir? Pardon? What are you driving? What what what'd you say, sir? What kind of vehicle are you driving? Oh, we we are in a uh oh. Uh, we're in a Rogue, a Nissan Rogue. Pulled off on the left hand side. This this is bad. Okay, what what is what color is your vehicle? Something came right through the windshield, sir. I understand. What what color is your I, vehicle? I, can you know what, sir? I, I cannot hear you. What color is your vehicle? It's black. Okay, do you have the four ways on? Uh, uh hold on here. Hold on, hold on, oh, hold on here. Uh, yes, I do now. Okay. There's a big, uh, there's a rock that came in. She is grasping for her life. Okay. What is your name, sir? My name's Randy Bud. The phone number you're. Oh calling my from. God! Her, half her brain's gone. Oh my God! Oh my God! Is there anybody else in the car with you? Yes, uh, my daughter. My daughter was driving. We, all of a sudden, there's an explosion. A rock went right through the windshield and hit, and hit her right in the head. Okay, how old's your wife, sir? Pardon, my, my wife. My wife is 53. 53. Okay. All right, sir. We're gonna send some help out there to you. Okay. In the meantime, try okay, not to move your wife. Please, don't. You don't touch anything, and we're going to get some help for you. Yeah, okay, we won't touch anything. Did, uh, don't, don't touch anything, Mom. Uh, did, uh, so, so you, you have us located? Yeah, I, I know where you're at. Okay. Okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Sharon Budd, a 53-year-old school teacher from Ohio, was a passenger in a car driven by her daughter on Interstate 80 in Pennsylvania when a rock smashed through the car's windshield, directly hitting her in the face. Her husband was sitting in the back seat while the couple's daughter, Kaylee, drove. Randy said it sounded like an explosion when the rock hit the car. Sharon had a large gash in her head, and her husband said the only way he could tell his wife was breathing was because the top of her head was moving and blood was coming out. Bud lost most of her vision capabilities and had a large part of her skull removed. It caused considerable damage to the skull, brain, and caused loss of sight in her right eye. The accused, Kiefer McGee, Tyler Porter, and brothers Dylan and Brett Lair, all aged between 17 and 18 years old, were reportedly on a troublemaking spree when they began throwing rocks from the overpass at cars moving along Interstate 80. That evening, the teenage boys had allegedly initially planned to swing baseball bats and throw rocks at parked cars. They drove a car through a field of corn, stole steaks from a grocery store, broke the windows of a house with a baseball bat, and stopped at a farm to pick up rocks to throw before proceeding to the highway overpass. McGee testified Dylan Lair threw a rock over the overpass toward moving cars below. Then, he heard a loud crashing sound. The accused all saw the hit vehicle pull over to the side of the road. I think that the uh, judge and the attorneys will make good decisions and decide on a proper consequence to the incident that happened to me in July. Does the family have a certain feeling as to whether it would be appropriate for them to be tried as adults? The family feels that they should be tried as adults. They made adult decisions, and uh, two of them are adults now. They've turned 18 since uh, July. And you continue to make remarkable progress. Thank you. What would you like to tell the people out there who have supported you over the last year and how far you've come? Uh, I would like to thank everyone that has given me support, which is huge because uh, I hear about it almost every day, either receive a card or a uh, message on uh, Facebook or my phone. And uh, again, I would just like to thank everyone for uh, the fundraisers and, and uh, all the different types of support that they've given us uh, since July. Sharon shared her thoughts on the court's pending ruling. District Attorney David Peter Johnson entered the rock into evidence. The football-shaped rock weighed at least 4.63 pounds. The incident changed Sharon's life forever. 
the gruesome actions of the accused marked the beginning of her medical troubles, forcing multiple surgeries and procedures. In August 2016, Randy died of self-inflicted gunshot wounds. DA Johnson said Randy loved his wife and supported her through the ordeal, but he had once said that he lost his wife as he knew her because of that rock. A double tragedy. Brett Lair was sentenced to a prison sentence of between 18 to 24 months. Porter, Dylan Lair, and McGee were sentenced to serve 22 months to 10 years, 54 months to 20 years, and 11 months to 23 months, respectively. Is there a call that you still can't wrap your head around? Let me know in the comments below so I can check it out. For more True 911 calls, watch this episode next.